Welcome to the late 90s. A small video game developer, Accolade, is fresh off the heels of their just released title, Eradicator. And they are now in the process of developing their next 3D action game. Although this one was set to blow its competition completely out of the water. It had amazing graphics, an advanced custom engine, and a unique aesthetic. All wrapped up in a fast paced third person shooter for the PC. Slave Zero. Yet the game apparently came and went, and was mostly forgotten. Today, it's only really remembered by a small but dedicated cult following. So why is this the case? Why did it die on store shelves? Why is it not as widely remembered as its contemporaries? Well, the answer is simpler than you'd think. It was the Dreamcast. Yeah, seriously, the Dreamcast killed Slave Zero. Slave Zero is an interesting game. A tragic game, honestly. A great example of how a developer can find lightning in a bottle only to have external forces outside of their control take that luck away, resulting in a huge flop. Which is a damn shame. And this game's days are numbered. The reason I'm making this video is that as of right now, another game, technically a prequel, Slave Zero X, is currently taking over the search algorithms. I mean, it's already the only game that shows up when you search for the original. So this is a last ditch effort by me to at least remind everybody about the amazingness and weirdness that is Slave Zero. Released in late 1999 by Accolade, later to be acquired and renamed into Infogrames, Slave Zero was a giant robot, fast-paced third-person shooter with a heavy mecha influence. This game has always managed to worm its way into my brain. I never managed to beat it until making this video, but it was something that I always came back to. So I think now is as perfect a time as ever to go back and look at Slave Zero, taking a deep dive through its single player, seeing how well it's held up, as well as uncovering why the game suffered a tragic demise into obscurity. Okay, we're we're already wasting time, let's begin. Oh, wait, we can't. Yeah, 1999 3D accelerated game. You bet your ass there's gonna be a huge hassle trying to set this thing up on modern hardware. This game is digitally distributed on Steam and GOG, and while the game works, it's not ideal. For starters, the crosshair is just broken. Slave Zero uses some weird math to draw its HUD, and for whatever reason, this math requires the game to be rendered at precisely 640 by 480. No other resolution works. Oh sure, you can force the resolution to change, but then your crosshair will literally be off. Like off by an annoying amount too, where you can't just eyeball it and try to brute force your way through the game. This is also on top of graphical issues and messing with the video modes that could have you spending hours opening and editing config files, constantly seeing the game crash before backing out and retrying it again. It is a fucking mess. But there's a single solution that fixed all of my problems. Peixoto's Patch. It's a program that has patches for a lot of other games, including Slave Zero. Do not worry about config files. Go download and install this patch right away. I did notice that the patch wouldn't detect Slave Zero if it was installed via Steam, no matter how many times I tried to point it to the right directory. But the GOG version found it right away with no issues. So I guess to be safe, make sure you buy the GOG copy instead. This patch has a lot of features, you can kind of mess with some of the graphic settings, but the big thing it does is that that it tricks the game into thinking it's being ran at 640 by 480 even if it's not so the game is able to render itself at hd theoretically it could do 4k as well the only downside is that the aspect ratio remains stuck to 4 by 3 which eh you know what i'm gonna accept that as a compromise the fact that i can still play this game that's good enough for me so the game is patched now let's begin darkness has befallen the first dynasty of the second millennium Missing an end there, but that's alright. The Sovereign Khan has strengthened his hold on the Asian conglomerates by seizing control of the towering capital, Megacity S19. This is starting to feel a little like a Star Wars title crawl. The Sov Khan's army will soon be complete with his legions of giant biomechanical slaves, war machines grown from cybernetic embryos and powered by the mysterious neutronium growth compound known as Dark Matter. Okay, I'll skip through it a bit. Basically, the Sov Khan is building a giant army of these slave machines, and an underground resistance movement is fighting to stop him. And to do that, they have to use a stolen slave that they took for themselves, Slave Zero. Which, this isn't stated in the intro, but I believe the lore behind Zero is that he's either the genetic blueprint or the originating DNA of all the other slaves. 
Hence his name. Either way, sci-fi megacity with giant robots. You know what? That sounds good to me. Also, this intro video plays right at the beginning of the game, before I even load into the menu. I don't know what it is. It feels like a trailer for the game, except rendered in real time. Honestly, it's pretty fucking awesome, I'll admit. <laughs> nice. Alright, let's begin. Slave Zero prototype shows all systems nominal. Guardian Chan, you are a go for assault on Kamurei. And careful, Guardian. That's an expensive tech you're operating. Not one scratch. Welcome to the industrial sector, Slave Zero. Whoa. Yeah, this is a giant robot game. Oh, wow. Damn, this game is almost 24 years old, and it still has me gawking at the visuals. Looks like we're right in the middle of downtown. Yeah, I think it's obligatory at this point that if you play a mech game, you have to be able to shoot at tiny tanks and helicopters. But wow, this combat. It's a third-person shooter, obviously. Although there is a mode to switch to first person. Eh, don't use it. <laughs> it's clunky, you gotta tab into the menu and change the option yourself. You can't bind it to a key, which actually would be kind of helpful, because swapping to first person does kind of help in making it easier to see your environment. Although it's literally just the camera zoomed in and stuck on the actual player model. It's not a real first person mode. This would be helpful as a quick toggle that you could switch to whenever you wanted, but as it is right now, just stick to third person. Movement itself is fast, but it isn't quite an arena shooter. You're a giant robot, and while you move fluidly for, say, a Gundam, you're still a giant building-sized piece of machinery. You literally need jet engines strapped to your back just to strafe. Platforming is shockingly intuitive, as the game has a built-in clamber mechanic that lets you climb up the ledges of buildings and platforms, which, as hilarious as this might sound, this might be one of the most intuitive clambering mechanics I think I've ever seen in a video game. And this is from 1999 as well. In this game, you're restricted to three weapons, although you can't really mix and match. You have to have a ballistic weapon, an energy weapon, and a shoulder-mounted rocket launcher. The way this game handles weapon swapping is also a little weird, but I'll get into that once we cross that bridge. And as a last resort, you can also pick up and throw objects. Things like streetlights and cars. It's fun throwing them at other mechs. Or better yet, grabbing some poor dude off the street and chucking him against the wall. Yeah, the devs knew who they were making this game for. Also, I was kind of shocked at the amount of destructibility, mostly in the specially placed buildings and objects. Simplistic for games now, but for 99, this level of detail would have been incredible. So to recap some of the story, I'm technically playing as Guardian Chen. There's a bit of a dynamic going on where I hear a disembodied voice telling me to bond my soul with Slave Zero. Take control of Slave Zero with your mind and with your soul. And I'm kind of feeling like the line is starting to blur between who I'm actually in control of. Is the game making a fourth wall break by implying that me controlling Slave Zero in the game is similar to Chen controlling it? Am I actually playing as the slave itself, being given nebulous commands by the unseen Chen in my mind? Are Chen and Slave Zero one and the same? I don't know. The game doesn't really dwell on it either. It's kind of a cool concept. Usually in Mecha, a mech and its pilot are distinctly two different beings. Either the mech is just a soulless machine that needs someone to pilot it, or it has its own consciousness that needs to bond with its pilot to control. Slave Zero feels like it's leaning towards the latter. Well, either way, this is a good first level. I'm enjoying it. Level design is good, the combat's fun. Yeah, I'll blow up a generator. Fuck yeah. I'm noticing that as I slowly upgrade my weapons, the combat is really coming into its own. Fighting enemies is fun. There's a good variety too, like any good action game. It feels great. There's a good flow here that incentivizes a lot of strafing, utilizing your missiles, and swapping between your machine gun or your plasma rifle. Also, enemies drop plenty of health and ammo. You can also get ammo and health from destroying buildings too, so it's kind of funny that in the middle of these gunfights you'll just randomly walk up to a building and smash it just to resupply. But yeah, this part of the game also introduces these giant elevator lifts, which are enemy spawners. Fire a couple of rockets into them, they're no problem. But what's funny is as good as the combat is, I'm still mesmerized by the level design. Lots of big industrial hangar bays, platforms, very much Blade Runner inspired. Slave Zero, your present location puts you at the perimeter of the lab sector. Infiltrate the labs, find the entrance to the gestation facility, and recover the embryos before the Sovcon uses them to grow more slaves for his evil army. 
All right, so we got to stop the slave embryos. Sounds good to me. It's kind of a creepy premise when you think about it. The idea that you have to actually grow your mechanized infantry in test tubes and genetically modify them to fit certain roles. I would question the reason behind not simply relying on a regular military, but hey, these are future rules. All 21st century assumptions are thrown out the window. The level itself is more of the same, but I don't mind it at all. I'm also noticing that the lighting in this game is very nice. Levels themselves are cast in really nice baked lighting. Lots of oranges and greens. It totally sells that city at night aesthetic, especially combined with the level design. There's also some dynamic lighting too, like when you strafe, your jets cast their own light source. Lots of effects cast their own lighting too. Again, this may seem dated to people now, but for 1999, this was cutting edge. And yeah, this game is just very beautiful to look at. We have more guns, more mechs to shoot, and just really awesome level design. One thing that should be constantly stressed is that when you see these streets and platforms is to just remember how huge they are compared to a person. Remember, Slave Zero himself is about 60 feet tall, which means that a lot of these areas must be absolutely massive. Now, silly me, I was originally going to make a joke about how building a 60 foot tall giant robot would probably be an insurmountable task, even for a future military force. But to my surprise, Japan has already made one. Yeah, they've got themselves a semi-operational 60-foot tall Gundam. So yeah, I take it back. An army of 60-foot tall robots is totally feasible in the future. It's definitely a little slow moving and the creators say that they built them just for fun, but I don't know. If you attach a couple 60 millimeters to that thing, you just know Raytheon will be pulling out the checkbooks. Anyways, I actually think this Gundam is a good sense of scale. Remember, he's about the same size as Slave Zero. So as I'm fighting this utterly massive dropship amidst these huge megastructures, just remember the size of that Gundam. After blowing up a huge carrier, I make my way deeper into the lab district. Huh. Well, the lab district looks like Quake 2. Either way, this is a sufficiently creepy area. It looks like the place where you'd be cloning a bunch of cybernetic embryos. There is darkness in this sector. I sense terror. There. That's it. The slave embryos. Oh man, what a fucking boss. He looks cool, he's fun to fight. The only thing I gotta complain about is how small the room is. There is not nearly enough space to strafe and dodge. Although most of the other bosses in this game don't have this problem. I will say, something I didn't really see at the time, but in editing I absolutely notice now, is how the room has all these little details to remind you that it's not just a purposeless boss room. There's small, human-sized observation windows, even regular streets leading into it. Just neat touches to remind you that, yeah, this place is built for giant slaves to walk through, but also for people as well. Oh man, I gotta save the level design for later, there's too much to gush about. We must devise a way to recapture the embryos before the Sov Khan can secure them again. Slave Zero, communications intercept confirms city comm systems have been restored, and the Sov Khan has dispatched several regiments of elite fighters to our Guardian base. Return to base. We need you here immediately. Sewer level. I mean, it's a pretty damn big sewer. Kind of reminds me of the sewer from Futurama, but come on, it's a fucking sewer level. But yeah, this part of the game is definitely when it starts to drag. Not only because of the bland environment, with rooms that look identical to each other and a pretty boring layout. Not only because the game forces you into a slow escort mission, but because some of the cracks are starting to show with the gameplay. Granted, they're very tiny cracks. The very first thing I want to mention are the heat-seeking missiles. They are fucking hilarious. Early on, you get a shoulder-mounted heat-seeking rocket launcher, and it's just an all-around good explosive weapon. However, this lock-on is always a little touchy. It'll lock onto enemies no problem, but if you maybe move at the last minute, or the enemy themselves move, then you get to watch that rocket sail around them and make some pretty incredible trajectories just to get to its target. I also mentioned this game has a weapon limit, and it's a bit more complex. You see, you can't really swap weapons out. Like, if you see a gun on the ground, you have to walk over it and pick it up automatically, if the game considers that gun to be an upgrade for your current one. Luckily, this is a menu option that you can disable if you want to, but what it does is that, say you have an SMG in your hand and you walk over a machine gun, you'll automatically pick up the machine gun, and it will replace your SMG. 
but you can't pick up that SMG again, even if you try. Now you have to go back into the menu and turn that feature off. This makes sense with some weapons, like a machine gun to a chain gun. That's a pretty straightforward upgrade. But then you get stuff like a chain gun to a grenade launcher, which... Uh, would you consider a grenade launcher an upgrade to a machine gun? They're like two vastly different weapons. It's not like Quake, where you want to upgrade from the shotgun to the super shotgun, or the nail gun to the super nail gun. Because all the guns in Slave Zero have slight variations in their role and usefulness. Like this would be so much easier if there was a hold E to pick up prompt. This is definitely something that if this game was ever patched or remastered, this is a must have addition. Let me switch out my damn guns, all right? Also on the topic of missing hotkeys, there's no quick save. Yeah, you have to go into the menu and save every single time, which gets annoying, especially in the late game, because the game limits how many save slots you can have. So you start having to reorganize them and delete old saves you don't need on the fly. But yeah, I'll admit there are kind of nitpicks. By this point in the game, we start getting these robot spiders, which are just a ho-hum enemy. I also got myself a green laser shotgun in this level, which kind of reminds me of the gun from Strife. Extraordinary. A fully gestated guardian slave. It's just one slave, my lord. It's just the first slave and seemed quite sufficient to drive off an elite regiment of sentinels. Double the troops, send in the whole protectorate, and release Sangonar. Slave Zero, we're picking up something. That's impossible. It's a soul called Slave. The door. Oh hell yeah, this music is sick. Okay, well, the boss fight is at least interesting. You have to kill this guy before toxic waste rises too high and kills you. It's easy enough. Like before, the space to maneuver is a little too small. At the very least, the platforming is decent. But with a little bit of luck, I finally kill him. Also, is it just me, or does this guy sound a little bit like Waspinator from Beast Wars? Also, a quick thing I should point out, excellent voice acting in this game. We've intercepted an encoded data burst from the Sobcon Central Command. Relaying now. The slave embryos have been successfully loaded on a cargo train and will be transported back to the military sector. And there is no... <gasps> Look out! Well, now that we have some weapon variety, the combat is really opening up. Again, the action in this game is just really solid. There's something cathartic about strafing through a neighborhood and blowing up entire buildings in the middle of a robot deathmatch. Actually, the more I play this game, the more I'm starting to wonder how the multiplayer would feel. Single player feels really good. I would kind of love to see this in a PvP game. And you know what? We're finally done with the sewers, and god damn it, this game is doing everything to draw me back in. We have more amazing cityscapes, a beautiful blue light bathing the level, massive suspended bridges and platforms god knows how many miles up in the air. I've been mentioning it throughout the video, but damn, this game looks incredible, especially for 1999. Tech-wise, it's definitely dated. Low-res textures, low-poly models, small environments, but you compare this game to a lot of other 1999 PC games, and this one is one of the best-looking titles out there. I would go so far as to say that the only games that were able to even compete with Slave Zero were the heavy hitters of 99, stuff like Unreal Tournament or Quake 3. And even then, that's a bit of an unfair comparison, considering how Slave Zero was meant to come out at least nine months before either of those two games, but it got delayed instead. And and yeah, I'll bring that up later, trust me. There's a whole story to that. So graphics wise, this is a good looking game. You can definitely see how they were able to cram in so much detail because a lot of the levels are very linear and limited to narrow streets and corridors. But even then, it's got a lot of nice touches and details like the lighting I mentioned earlier. Models are low poly, obviously, although they don't look bad. In fact, they have quite a lot of character, especially the mechs. I won't spoil the boss fights later in the game, but you come up against increasingly bizarre mech designs. If you're a hardcore mecha fan, I think Slave Zero could be a good source of inspiration. But what Slave Zero does 
does is it amazingly captures the aesthetic of a massive sci-fi megacity, all from the perspective of a giant robot. Every texture has to reflect that what you're looking at is a super detailed building, simply scaled down because of how massive you are. And yeah, I think this whole aspect of the game is a slam dunk. The amount of detail that these level designers were able to fit in for such limited tech is impressive, even now. This game is one tiny miniature cyberpunk city, with everything you could ask for. Tiny buildings, tiny roads with actual tiny cars and traffic signs, tiny people walking around in tiny alleyways and tiny shopping districts. Look, I love how you can set trees on fire. Lots of awesome little details like that, which kind of carries over into level design, which I will get into later. Here, this next level is a good example of trying to sell a world, and not just a single linear mission. We're apparently chasing a train full of embryos before it can escape. So we're headed deeper towards a train terminal. It is similar to the previous mission, but there's a lot less high-tech blue buildings and some more older, concrete-looking areas and roads. It's got a very Metropolis vibe to it. My imagination was running wild here. I was getting the idea that we were in some sort of old town, or at least an older part of the city that probably existed before the techno megacity was built around it. There's a heavy use of concrete apartment blocks, dark and dreary streets, old tunnels covered in graffiti. This is very clearly an old run down part of town. Once again, I felt completely lost in this game's world, and I mean that in a good way. By this point, I've also gotten one of the best weapons in the game, this railgun laser thing. It can one-shot most enemies. Yeah, I never swapped out of this thing. So with this, I kind of fell into a rhythm with the combat. There's always a fight around each corner, but it feels fair and enjoyable. Also, it doesn't have those fucking monster closets that other games have. And you know what? I think at this point in the game, I was 100% immersed in it. I still can't tell what got me more, the fun combat or just the amazing environments. After some wandering, we finally get to our train, and we fight off some more enemies. And finally, backup arrives. Congratulations, embryo secure and en route. Elite Zero, Manta One to Honored Mother, I've got Slave Zero. Roger that, Manta One. Proceed to drop off point in Sector 7. Yes, ma'am. We've lost the tanks, my lord. Oh shit. Captain, have you anything to add? Unleash Revenant Prime. Finish the job. That sounds ominous. So I think we're just outright on our way to kill the Sovcon himself. I mean, I guess that's a plan. Yeah, most of the plot in this game is Slave Zero being commanded to go here and do a thing. I mean, it's pretty basic, so don't go into this expecting Deus Ex. Not that I mind. It's meant to be a giant mech game. All I need to know is who and what I have to blow up. That's good enough for me. Besides, the story kind of took a backseat to me just gawking at even more of the game's level design. Because wow, guys, just look at the visuals the game is offering us. Even more blue lit roads in the sky, massive sci-fi towers, brightly lit multi-level spaces that look like marketplaces. Oh man, okay, I'm getting distracted again. Actually, you know what? Fine. Let's talk about what I really love about Slave Zero and what I think Slave Zero does better than most other games. It's world. Slave Zero has such an amazing atmosphere and attention to detail that in nearly every level, I found myself just kind of immersed. I love just imagining the little areas of this game. Like this spot right here. An open parking lot enclosed by buildings surrounding it. What's the purpose of this? Why would you need a parking lot in an enclosed courtyard? What do people use it for? Or look at these buildings. What are they? Apartment blocks? How are they floating? Yeah, look how structurally safe this one is. How do people come and go? Would you even want to live here? As basic as the graphics are, I was shocked at how much my imagination was running with this game. I think the fact that it was low poly and low res may have helped with that. Because sometimes in older games, you would have to fill in the blanks yourself. And in a way, it would make the world seem all the more interesting. Like what could these buildings all be? Even with the dated graphics, the atmosphere really shines through, and it's all nailed by these little details from the level designers and texture artists. There wasn't a single level in this game that didn't remind me that I was a 60 foot tall robot. Like every level, no matter where you are, there'll be roads, or parking lots, or billboards. Maybe some uneven looking highways and overpasses that look surprisingly natural and grounded. Actually, one thing that I think is done really well is the architecture. This game is set in a cyberpunk megacity, except it's not going for a 100% sci-fi look. A lot of the early missions are set on the lower levels of the megacity, likely where old architecture meets newer techno megastructures. So you get the sci-fi cyberpunk city mixed in with some pretty normal looking buildings. And this seems like it would clash artistically, but it actually works really well. 
This game could have just been a mess of abstract looking buildings with weird architecture. And it would have been so much easier for the level designers too. Just make some blocky, abstract shapes and call it a city. But instead, for Slave Zero, in what seems like a divine alliance between the art team and the level designers, they went above and beyond just to sell the fact that you are playing from a giant robot's perspective. These more contemporary looking buildings and roads are there for you to grasp just how big Slave Zero really is. Seeing him stand next to a factory or an apartment building helps visualize that. Because when the game does put you in areas that are just sci-fi techno buildings, you still have a frame of reference in your mind of how big you are, which then adds to the even greater sense of scale that the city itself has, making these pretty alright looking vistas and city shots look even more insane. And there's plenty of mech games that fail to do this, some that just don't keep the illusion of scale. Okay, this is a weird tangent. There was a Gundam multiplayer game that came out recently. I don't have anything to say about its quality. I'm just not into generic hero shooters, sorry. But I will mention its map visuals. This is a good example of how not to do a giant robot game with empty tech corridors lacking any meaningful sense of scale. Like seriously, look at these maps. If I got rid of the Gundams and replaced them with like, I don't know, Halo Spartans, would you even be able to tell that this is supposed to be a giant 60 foot tall person? Any good giant robot game, not even just Slave Zero, plenty of others too, go the extra mile to remind you how big you are. Constantly throwing stuff like little cars at you or crowds of people, even scaling down architectures and buildings just to sell the idea that yes, you are a giant robot, don't forget it. I also love how in Slave Zero, the layouts themselves feel very grounded as a city. A lot of the city areas in this game don't necessarily feel like a giant robot is meant to be walking through it. Of course, it is. This is a video game. But the level designers have used amazing details to create this really immersive city. Like sure, a couple areas in the game are designed for other slaves. That's the whole premise of the story. But if you look closer, look at all the little buildings and staircases. Look at all these little details that show that even though this is built for giant robots, humans are still able to get around through them. But once you leave these areas and you venture deep into the city, paths become winding. Roads are built for cars, not you. Even areas where you have to jump and climb through the buildings to progress. It's such an amazing world to explore. I'm also going to say this. Any environment junkies out there? You know, if you're the kind of person who obsesses over environments and levels in video games, be careful with this game. Are you someone who could have fun analyzing a multiplayer map or stare at some empty source map for hours dreaming up the lore behind it? Like, does your imagination wander when you stare at old video game environments? Well, for you guys, I'm telling you not to play this game. I'm saying this the same way I would tell a cocaine addict not to visit Columbia. You guys are gonna die in your computer chairs getting lost in these levels. Hell, I almost did myself. I actually had to force myself at some parts of the game to keep progressing through the level. Because a lot of the times I would just stand still and take in the environments. So I worry that if some of you have worse impulse control than me, then you guys are going to spend hours just sifting through each level, looking for details and fantasizing about the world. That might be dangerous. Also another slightly related side tangent, I kind of want to see some of these areas scaled up, like a giant city recreation of some of these levels, just to see the perspective of a person. I imagine it would look like one of those city maps you see for Gmod. Hell, if you converted one of these into a giant source city map, it could probably make a good dark RP server. Okay, I'm losing the plot again. I guess I have to gush even more about this game, because Mission 9 ends with this fucking awesome boss fight. You have to fight on top of the roofs of these giant skyscrapers that kind of remind me of the map Morpheus from Unreal Tournament. It's a little stressful since these bosses will start to destroy the buildings you're standing on, so you do have a time limit until you're literally thrown to your death. But it's pretty easy. Just aim your shots, save your ammo, it's doable. But damn, I love how these bosses look. Like they are each this half humanoid, half serpent mech, who then combine with one another into an even bigger mech. I keep bringing it up, but I think Slave Zero definitely has some of the most unique mech designs I've seen for a game. Again, all the slaves are genetically engineered and are technically cyborgs and not just robots. So this kind of allows for a lot of creativity in the mechs, more so than you'd have in other mech games. They make for really great terrifying boss fights. But yeah, this guy, after a couple tries, I finally whittle him down. The next mission takes us deep into what looks like a military base, which I was worried that the environments would take a back seat. But believe it or not, I think this actually might have been one of my favorite areas in the game so far. The combat is still fun, which might be helping, but aesthetically this part of the game was giving me very good vibes. Like, I don't know how to describe it. 
I was getting a ton of different feelings here. There was a little bit of Gundam in there, a lot of Half-Life. I mentioned how this game could easily have become just a generic abstract tech corridor, and this level totally should have ended up that way, as just a generic mech military base. But once again, more details are scattered everywhere. Because while this was clearly a place built for giant robots, there are roads and walkways and little platforms with staircases built everywhere just so people can easily move around. It's the little details that sell it. We also fight this absolutely giant fucking mech carrier thing. You kind of forget the sense of scale that this thing has, because remember how tall I am. Now compare me to that. It also doesn't help that this thing literally looks like a titan from 40k, although sadly we don't get to see it move. I will say, I'm kind of shocked at how solid a lot of the gameplay still is. I mentioned it has its quirks, but for the most part, I want to say this combat holds up. For the most part. Yeah, watch me try and walk into this elevator. Yep. Thanks to you, we're still in this fight. Now find the slave endoskeletons and move. We won't be welcome here much longer. The next mission is more of the same, although now we're retrieving endoskeletons. There's kind of a morbidness behind the resistance plan, where instead of simply trying to come up with ways to counter the Sovcon slave army, we'd rather just capture and reprogram our own. Fighting fire with fire, I guess. Anyways, it's just a remix of the previous level. Combat is still fun, levels are great to look at. Look, I love these little walkways with people walking on them. I'm also able to pick up the artillery cannon. It's not that good. I think the problem I had with it is that while the damage was good, it chewed through ammo and it had a very short range. Whereas with a simple machine gun or a chain gun, it was slower to kill enemies, but it was ammo efficient as well as usable at all ranges. Now this thing would be good as an additional weapon to my arsenal, but as the stand-in jack of all trades, not really. There's also one thing I forgot to mention, the music. Oh yeah, you thought I wouldn't talk about it, didn't you? Slave Zero has a sick industrial electronic soundtrack and it's fucking awesome. It was composed by a guy named Randy Atkins and sadly, like most info for this game, I cannot for the life of me find any more info about his work. The only other game I know he composed the soundtrack for was the Amiga game Defenders of the Crown, so who knows. All I can say is that Slave Zero's OST is a work of art and thank god the current releases of the game still have the soundtrack intact. The music has a lot of atmosphere building too. It's got intense industrial guitars and synth for action scenes, but also real moody moments too. Gives a kind of bleak, overwhelming atmosphere to the city. This soundtrack is so good in fact that I've used it for a few other videos. Also here's a tip to anyone wanting to edit videos for YouTube but they're looking for good background music. Old, semi-abandonware video game soundtracks are your best friends. Now granted, you have to be comfortable with the sound of late 90s, early 2000s music, but hey, you can stumble on some hidden gems doing that. So yeah, the music's fucking amazing, and I wish they would release a proper digital soundtrack already. Slave Zero, we have confirmation the Sovcon is developing a powerful new weapon, specifically designed for slave units. Retrieve the prototype from the Weapons Development Center deep in the Imperial Fortress. After getting the endoskeletons, we're now given a new objective. Hunt down and obtain a dark matter weapon. Yeah, the game mentioned it earlier, but all the slaves seem to run on the substance called dark matter, which best I can tell isn't actual dark matter. It's just what the substance is called. Anyways, this is just another excuse for us to walk through more military bases. While the levels do start to stray into generic sci-fi corridors, they seem to make up for it with excellent art direction. This area specifically was kind of giving me like Star Wars Cloud City vibes. It's got a surrealness to it, like the buildings just floating over a black empty void, big, almost reactor looking things inside a massive open space enclosed on all sides. Just a very strange atmosphere, I can't explain it. Well all of this is just a lead up to a pretty epic boss fight. My god! Hey, can you guess that this game was inspired by Quake? Well, she's no Ragnara. It's a decent boss fight, at least there's space to maneuver here. The strategy for all these bosses so far has usually just been to run around and shoot them until they die. Which, eh, I'll take it. Halfway through, she drops her Dark Matter gun. And holy shit, this is the game's BFG. Low ammo, insane damage. Yeah, she's a piece of cake after. Hell yeah. Has just acknowledged. The Sovcon is moving against us now. 
This mission takes us back into the city and wow, I love the aesthetic here. Before we've been fighting deep inside the mega city, kind of on the lower levels or at least in military bases and sewers. Now we're near the top and we're seeing the tops of all these skyscrapers and even the sky. Some of these environments like with the big art deco bridges feel ripped straight out of like Batman the Animated Series or even Batman Beyond. I love this little enclosed area. Buildings with parking lots on top of them, a suspended road bridge. What's the point of all this? Who knows, but it makes my imagination wander. Okay, seriously, imagine being able to explore these environments at the scale of a person. That would be so fucking rad, man. I love how the little details are selling that this is kind of a more wealthy part of the city. Less grimy marketplaces and industrial equipment, and more sterile clean buildings and rooftops. I like the colors too, going for a deep blue bordering on purple, lit up by bright neon signs. I think Slave Zero truly nails the cyberpunk aesthetic, especially when you consider how limited the graphics are. You can tell the devs poured their heart and soul into this game. And speaking of... In making this video, I got to learn a little bit about how this game was developed, and man, is it a roller coaster ride. A lot of this info I managed to grab from an old interview with a few of the devs that got published on PC World. This interview was back in 2014, but it has some amazing insights into the game. There actually aren't that many retrospective interviews or documentation whatsoever about Slave Zero and Accolade. It is hard to find. In fact, most of the sources I could even find were promotional interviews for the game taken back in 99. I could not find a single interview with the developers of Slave Zero outside of this one article for PC World. And guess what? This very fucking interview got taken down too. Yeah, the webpage no longer exists. I'm so glad someone made a web archive snapshot of it, otherwise this shit would have been completely memory hold. It's a shame because all info about this game and not Slave Zero X has basically been scrubbed off the internet. So this interview is all we got. So I will admit this interview probably has a little bit of bias to it, but it's all I got to piece together what happened. Even still, it is a fascinating interview and I highly recommend any Slave Zero fans watching to go give it a read. I have a link to the web archive page in the description. I'll briefly give some highlights. First, I find the development behind this game really interesting, especially seeing all the concepts that sprouted up here and there, and that made Slave Zero into what it eventually turned into. The main inspiration for this game came from the team wanting to show off highly dense and detailed levels that weren't just bland abstract corridors. They basically wanted to one-up a lot of their competitors, so a Blade Runner-esque cyberpunk city seemed ideal for this. In fact, early on the game was meant to be a bounty hunter style third-person shooter, inspired by, and I'm quoting lead artist, Ken Capelli here, Yasushi Nirasawa, Hugh Ferris, and pre-Matrix 90s latex fetish wear. Of course, the idea of making a dense cyberpunk world was problematic given how limited you would be with polygon counts. You could not render something at that scale on a computer in 1999. You would have to optimize the hell out of it with low-res sprites, low-poly models that would basically look terrible up close. Luckily for them, a new hire to the studio had a suggestion. Sean Vesh, just fresh off Interstate 76, and more importantly, Mech Warrior 2. Allegedly, he suggested that to pull off this environment, they had to make it a giant robot game. This made things easy because sprites of people and cars could just be scaled down so that their polygon limits wouldn't be noticeable. According to this interview, the developers said that this was their light bulb moment. From there, it was a back and forth between three of the employees, Ken, Sean, and Accolade producer Matt Powers, who ironed out the game's concept, premise, and even gameplay. Ken and Sean brought the giant robot inspirations, with Sean bringing his experience from Mech Warrior and Ken bringing some inspiration from Neon Genesis Evangelion. This was combined with Matt wanting an action shooter, so it seemed like they had their game idea. During development, many more inspirations came to the team. Early on, the idea was chosen to make the giant robots sleek and sexy. Not quite the slow, tank-like mechs of Mech Warrior, but more inspired by anime, like the aforementioned Evangelion as well as Gundam. There's also a little bit of inspiration taken from H.R. Geiger, which may have evolved into the robots becoming these biomechanical living organisms. Also, there's another quote from Ken here that I just found funny. He was asked about the reaction people outside their team had to their weird biomechanical mecha concept, he said, quote, it focus tested pretty well among core gamers, but the execs were pretty freaked out by them. Also, side tangent about Accolade at this time, they were a long lasting game developer slash publisher from the 80s that never went big like Activision or EA. So a lot of games developed in that time had far more creative control than you'd see in their competitors. Of course, this was actually about to change right in the middle of development for Slave Zero, where they were bought out by Infogrames. Luckily, Slave Zero seemed to retain a lot of its creative freedom, even up until release, mostly because it was already finished, so it got through unscathed. 
mostly unscathed. Another really interesting thing to hear about this game was just how enthusiastic the team was to work on it. Some of the developers even brought their PCs home every night just to work on the levels. The game's senior artist, Trevor Grimshaw, said the team was highly spirited and super passionate towards the game. He even said it was one of the funnest games he ever worked on. This absolutely shines through the game, even today. Playing it now, I can 100% see the amount of passion that was poured into Slave Zero. This game has clear signs that the people working on it were a passionate team of inspired geeks who actually cared of what they were making, which makes the fact that this game was a big flop a real shame. The big reason I was interested in this interview is that it explains why Slave Zero totally bombed and why it became as obscure as it is now. Of course, it's hard to gauge how accurate all this info is from a single person on the ground. Like, I'm sure the devs making this game totally had some bias in how they saw events go down. But hey, it's the only story that's out there. Not like there's anyone else to refute them. So what killed Slave Zero? According to these developers, it was the Dreamcast. I personally believe that Accolade should never have released the game on Dreamcast. For starters, this game was pretty much set to be a PC exclusive, because obviously it only could be ran on a PC. Accolade did mention that they were looking at maybe the PS1, which would have been hilarious to see, but it was eventually accepted among the dev team that 5th gen consoles were just out of the question. There was no way they'd be able to run a game this advanced, so they continued working on the PC game. It was Sega who approached them first, and they wanted to make a deal where alongside the PC release, there would also be a Dreamcast port. And since the specs of the Dreamcast seemed powerful enough to run it, at least at first glance, a deal was struck and the Dreamcast port of Slave Zero began development. However, there was a big issue. Part of the deal required that both versions of the game, PC and Dreamcast, they had to be released at the same time. And this was a problem for Accolade, as the game was pretty much ready to ship by early 1999. Yeah, this thing was pretty much ready to go by February. But the Dreamcast port was scheduled nine months later in the same year. This was made worse by the fact that Accolade had planned their entire advertising budget around an early 1999 release, meaning that there was no money left over to continue marketing the game for the rest of those nine months. So the PC port of the game was put on ice. Actually, there's a term for it called code freeze. No work or modifying the code allowed whatsoever in that entire span of time nine months. Instead, all effort was put into the Dreamcast version. One of the developers in the interview even remarked how it was a shame because there could have been a ridiculous amount of extra work and polish done to the PC release. I actually want you to remember that later in the video, especially as we talk about some of the bugs. So for nine months, there was no marketing or advertising for this game. No PC release showed up on store shelves and everyone just kind of forgot about it. Slave Zero just disappeared off the face of the earth. Eventually, by the time November rolled around, it finally released on Dreamcast and PC. Except the only advertising money left was saved for the Dreamcast port, and the PC port was just kind of silently thrown into stores. Hell, a lot of people didn't even know that it was a PC game. In fact, I mentioned the prequel earlier, and literally every single article about that game I could find simply referred to Slave Zero as a Dreamcast game. Yeah, Slave Zero, that Dreamcast game. Which is so bizarre. The whole time I keep seeing these articles and thinking to myself, is Slave Zero really a Dreamcast game? Or were there more people who owned a Dreamcast than I thought? This is like Quake coming out and then everyone associating Quake not as the PC game, but as the N64 game. Yeah, Quake, that game for the N64. Or Half-Life, that game for the PS2. No, I'm sorry, it's even weirder than that. Because those consoles were at least popular, not the Dreamcast. And it was a bad fucking port too. Even the developers think so. Downgraded graphics, huge frame drops, clunky controls with bad aiming. I didn't even really think about it until just now. But look at a Dreamcast controller. A single analog stick. How the hell are you supposed to navigate a 3D environment while also aiming and shooting with a controller like this? As far as I'm concerned, this port was doomed from the start. Also, the Dreamcast version lacked some of the music the PC release had. Which again, one of the developers even lamented that most players never got to hear the full soundtrack. So yeah, worse performance, fewer enemies, even less cars and people. What? That's like the best thing about Slave Zero. I think to add insult to injury, the Dreamcast itself was a failed console, getting discontinued a year and a half later. So, yeah, the Dreamcast, it killed Slave Zero. Man, reading this interview is just tragic. Ken, who I mentioned earlier, said that Slave Zero was the lowest selling game he had 
ever worked on. He also mentioned a really interesting insight into game development at the time, especially on the PC. A 9 month delay today? That doesn't sound like the end of the world. But in 1999, you would already be out of date with your competitors. 3D accelerated technology was advancing so fucking fast at such an exponential rate that waiting even a couple months could put you drastically behind everybody else. PC video game tech was going through the most chaotic arms race it had ever been in. So a 9 month setback with no development whatsoever was certainly a death sentence, even if they still had marketing and an advertising budget. Which hey, thanks to that code freeze, meant that the devs were never allowed to tinker or modify the game, as it just sat there abandoned on company hard drives. The last thing from this interview, and it really stings, was hearing about what the devs wanted for a sequel. Obviously there never was one considering how badly performed. But there were some ideas. Modular upgradable mechs, multiple bigger cities, wall climbing. Oh man, we got robbed here. Anyways, the interview is linked in the description. If you're a fan of this game, I'd say it's a worthwhile read. Tragic, but also very inspiring to see how much love and effort was put into it. It definitely makes me appreciate this game all the more. Also, I need to get this out of the way. Until I was making this video, I had no fucking clue that they were making a prequel for this game. Slave Zero X. Also, spoiler, it has virtually nothing to do with the original. It looks like a 2D fighting game without giant robots. Also, it's being written by one of the writers behind Ruby. Christ, that's basically a warning label. I'm kind of annoyed by it. First, this has completely destroyed Slave Zero's online presence. Seriously, try searching for any Slave Zero related information. Nope, Slave Zero X, just article after article about this fucking new game, not the older one. Which, eh, I guess that makes sense. I have to blame search algorithms for that one. This did make research for this video way too fucking hard, I'll tell you that much. Secondly, the rights owners for Slave Zero are doing fuck all with the game. No patches, no fixes, no widescreen support, yet they're slapping the name Slave Zero onto an unrelated fighting game. Probably because, and this is my theory, that fighting game has a vague connection to being sci-fi and cyberpunk. So the publishers probably just thought, hey, what cyberpunk properties do we have? Let's throw Slave Zero on there. Anyways, that's the sad state of Slave Zero right now. Okay, we're almost done with this thing, so let's get to the final level. Mission 14. Oh god, this last level. I think the entire game, up until this point, I had the thought in my mind like, oh yeah, this game is incredible. Some stumbles here and there, but had the game ended at the second to last level, I literally would have called it a perfect masterpiece. But then this level reminded me maybe why this game was never quite as fondly remembered as I thought it should be. And it could just be me. It could just be me running this game on modern hardware. But this last part has so little polish, I can't even wrap my head around it. So the level starts off... Decently. I like the aesthetic. Tranquil Japanese gardens underneath a hellish red sky. I dig it. A little boxy, but otherwise pretty unassuming. Gameplay's still good. Enemies are a little harder, but I'm enjoying it. Yep, some enemies to fight. Just shoot at them like normal. Shoot at this guy. No problem. Then shoot at this guy over here. The game crashed. Well, th that's no piggy. This happens a lot with older games. Being the experienced gamer that I am, I rebooted the game and tried again. Jump up, try another approach, shoot these two enemies over here. Uh oh, we might have a problem. I should point out that up until this part of the game, there have been no hard crashes like this whatsoever, outside of me setting it up. Running with the game patched, I had a smooth experience right up until now. So I took to scouring the web for solutions, which was pretty hard. Again, there is so little info about this game. I found a couple scattered forum posts, but this one Steam post made me do a double take. So wait, there are enemies in this game that if you kill, they'll just hard crash your game? Well, uh, okay, maybe this one guy is just the exception. Maybe the rest of the game is smooth sailing. Oh no. So now I have officially crossed over into late 90s jank. This is now a level where I know for a fact that a certain number of enemies, more than one, will in fact crash the game if I kill them. Well, fuck. <laughs> The paranoid part of my brain took over right about here. I was spamming the save button like nobody's business, but every single enemy I saw now had a potential secret nuclear bomb that if I mistakenly shot at, would crash my game to desktop. Oh god. What the hell? Where did this come from? What's even causing this glitch in the first place? Is it like a memory leak error or something? I wish I knew. So I had only one option. To run past them. Which thank god is a viable strategy. 
Of course, at this point, I think I might be in the clear for avoiding crashes. Never mind. Anyway, trying that again, we head into the palace and... Huh? What? Eh, what happened? I didn't shoot at anybody. Oh no. Is the level itself bugged? Am I gonna crash if I reach a certain point in the game? Has my entire run been fucked? Let's try that again, just to be safe. Uh, huh. No crashes this time. Yeah, I guess the solution was to do the exact same thing I've already done. Video games, everybody. Well, now I find myself in a flooded tunnel system and... Oh, I thought I was in the clear. I guess not. Well, after some more wandering and careful maneuvering, I finally, finally get to the end of the level. Which I need to stress, I am shortening a ton of shit that I had to go through. But at least we're almost done. Well, this guy is clearly the final boss. Huh, he's not taking a lot of damage. Matter of fact, he's not taking any damage. What the fuck? Okay, I'm heading back to the internet. Yep, there it is. I gotta shoot him in his face. Which I didn't expect to be so fucking hard, but apparently it is. A lot of the weapons that you have at this point in the game are not built for this boss fight. Your artillery cannon is fucking useless because he's so big and so tall that you really can't hit his face unless you're right up next to him, which puts you in danger of his close range attacks. The dark matter gun deals a good amount of damage if you can land a hit, but its ammo is super limited. Plus remember, it's a slow moving projectile that you have to hit perfectly. You also can't do splash damage to his face either. So if you hit his head with an explosive weapon, his face doesn't take any damage from that. That projectile your gun fires has to hit him square in the face, otherwise he'll be unharmed. So I'm dealing with that, and then guess what? Turns out that even if I do manage my shots, and do take it slow, and aim just for his face, I literally don't have enough ammo to defeat him. Like, look at this. I've gotten him down all the way to red. A couple times, in fact. But every single time, I run out of ammo for both of my guns. My missiles are useless too, because again, I can't aim them at his face without them locking on. So fucking great. Like most games would give the boss multiple phases, and in between each one you might be able to reheal or regain ammo. Not in Slave Zero, you are left on your own, and you're basically shit out of luck if you run out of ammo. I'm playing on medium by the way. I have seen forum users speculate that hard mode might genuinely be impossible to beat for Slave Zero. It's a shame because he's a fun boss, all things considered. He's got a lot of attack patterns, he looks cool, this arena is nice and open. So I tried, and tried, and tried, and guys, I couldn't do it. I threw in the towel, I broke out the cheats, and hilariously I couldn't even load into the boss fight because that would crash the game. So I had to make a save in the previous level to use my cheats there. And I experimented with every weapon combination I could think of. Would you believe that nothing I did worked? Having access to every gun in the game and still I wasn't able to beat this guy? Ah, uh, fuck. The game's gonna make me do it? Time for infinite ammo. I fucking hate doing this. I'm not against cheats in single player games. I just don't like using them for a vanilla playthrough. Sometimes I just want to experience a game the way it was meant to be played. And being forced to resort to cheats definitely breaks my enjoyment of the game. I don't know, I may be weird. I get it. And even with infinite ammo, I am shocked at how long it takes to kill him. So many dark matter shots just to bring down his health. But fucking amazingly, after cheating our way to the finish line, we beat him. Slave Zero. 
Man, I'm in a weird predicament right now. As I was playing it, I kept thinking to myself, wow, this might be a new all-time favorite. It's fantastic, it's unique. It's just overall a really timeless feeling game. Even as I encountered little hiccups, they didn't affect my overall experience. Hell, even the annoying amount of time it took to set this game up didn't even phase me. So even with those struggles, I wanted to end the video on how amazing this game is. But fuck me, those last few moments, that final boss, this entire level was complete agony. From the constant crashing to the final boss requiring me to literally cheat my way through. It was such a bullshit difficulty curve that it kind of makes me regret my entire playthrough up until that point. As sad as that is to say, because now I can no longer say that Slave Zero is an awesome timeless game that holds up really well. I have to put an asterisk next to it. Slave Zero is an awesome timeless game that holds up really well for all but one mission, which then requires you to basically cheat your way through it. I think this is why a bad last level leaves such a lasting impression and a really bad taste in your mouth, even if the rest of the game was amazing. It's because those are the only emotions fresh in your memory as you close the game and recollect your thoughts. Hey, do you remember another retrospective I did on another giant robot game? Gunmetal. Well, that game, I don't think it's as good as Slave Zero. It's not bad, but it's just an okay budget game. However, that game had a really frustrating final boss that required trial and error and overall left a bad impression. And I feel the devs knew that. Because do you know what they did? They didn't make that final boss the last level. They ended it with a level more representative of the rest of the game, making it fun, not quite as challenging, and just really a nice level to cool down in. And then the game ends. And you know what? I walked away from Gunmetal happy and satisfied. Slave Zero just made me annoyed that my last few moments with this game were full of crashes, bugs, and horrible difficulty spikes. Made even worse by the fact that the rest of this game up until this point, even with those other glitches, was still an amazing experience. Because I'll say it, those earlier levels, and you know what, even up until the final mission, were fucking awesome. I need to clarify, this is not a janky, broken, unbalanced video game from 1999. Unlike other games I've covered on this channel. Hell, even other games published by the same publisher. This is a game 93% amazing and timeless, with really polished levels, really fun gameplay, and it's just an overall amazing game. Just flat out. Combat was great, the world design was breathtaking, the aesthetic was fucking rad, and yeah, I mean timeless. Up until the last part of the game, it is very much approachable. Slave Zero holds up shockingly well, to the point where I imagine even newer people unfamiliar with this game could easily pick it up and enjoy it today, no problem. Hell, I discovered this game as a teenager many, many years after its release, so I'm literally an example of that happening. But that last mission, dear god is it rough. I'd say once you get to that level, you require are way more caution than you've ever had before. Caution that relies on you to predict the future and to avoid game crashes. Man, if only the developers had an extra nine months to playtest that final level and polish it. If only. But that's Slave Zero. And you know what? Ignoring that awful last level is a pretty great game. I was lamenting it earlier, but I'd be lying if I said this game didn't manage to worm its way into my all-time favorite games. I'd actually say it's right on the cusp between a genuine classic and a forgotten cult classic. Not quite as flawless and perfect, but full of soul and character with some awesome fucking gameplay. Before I end this video, I'm actually going to make a Slave Zero wish list. There is a teeny tiny little bit of work that can be done to Slave Zero that can make it into a timeless classic. First, the last couple levels of this game need to be patched. And glitches aside, that final boss is fucking stupid. Lower the health on it. So that's what I'd want to see at the very least. Secondly, I wouldn't mind a few quality of life changes. A button to swap weapons instead of it just being an automatic pickup thing, that would be kind of nice. Same goes for a button to switch between third and first person. Also, please give me a quick save button. Thirdly, a widescreen patch would also be very appreciated. And even now, the fact that people can literally run this game in 4K, but lock to a 4x3 aspect ratio is hilarious. Give Slave Zero widescreen, please. I was going to say that this game needs a classic Night Dive facelift, but turns out Night Dive already had a hand in porting this game to digital stores. So I'm just going to openly ask, Night Dive, please help fix this game. It's an odd game, but I think it's still worth checking out. As I said earlier, if you want to play this game, get the GOG version, just to be safe. Then get Peshoto's patch for it. It's super easy to install, and I'll have a link in the description. And yeah, I still think despite its flaws, it's at least worth a look. Because outside of that final mission, Slave Zero is an immensely playable game, with slick combat and an incredible world to get immersed in. It's got a lot of soul, and it's incredibly fun too. It's a shame that this IP is just collecting dust. I know they're making a prequel, but come on, that's not a legitimate successor. Well, that's the video. 
Stay tuned next time for another sci-fi third-person shooter. Take care, dudes.